You're listening to the Infinite Banking Mastery Podcast. Did you know that you could build a tax-free pool of wealth that's liquid and accessible all your life while building your retirement nest egg? Gain full control of your financial future and stop relying on the government and banks. The wealthy have already discovered this wealth building secret. Now it's your turn to get financially secure without following the conventional wisdom that keeps you in debt to banks. Now here's your host, Valerie LaRoque. Hello and welcome to the Infinite Banking Mastery Podcast. Thank you for listening in. Keeping it tax free. That's what we are going to be talking about today. And I'm referring to keeping the growth inside your policy income tax free because there certainly is a way for it to become taxable at any time once you've started the contract. So you've got to make sure that once you've started, it's on the right path to remain tax free and that the your actions into the future future, don't cause it to become taxable. So there's a special term in our industry for describing a life insurance policy that has become taxable. The IRS classifies these types of policies as modified endowment contracts. We call it MEC for short. So what you don't ever want to do is MEC your contract. Therefore, you will want to be sure you are working with an IBC practitioner who understands this very well and knows how to best build your contract for your current budget and on into the future. Because in addition to wanting the premiums structured for your policy to be cash efficient, you will want to be sure also that it is structured not to become a mech. In addition, you will want to be sure your premiums are structured according to your future plans for the contract, your current budget, and what your affordability looks like into the future because your premium, your ability to pay premium may change and shift as the years go by. And so if we can kind of forecast some of that, we can factor that in from the beginning. So how does my policy become a mech? You're probably asking. And what exactly does that mean? Well, let me go over a chart out of Nelson Nash's book to help better describe this. If you happen to have the book, you can go on over to page 38 of the book. There's a little chart there, a little picture diagram that just helps to describe. So what Nelson has going on here with this little picture diagram, he has on the far left, he has written single premium policy. And on the far right, he has written term insurance policy because those two things are polar opposites. So now I'm sure a lot of you have an understanding of term or you might think you understand term pretty well. I'm just gonna cover it really quickly. It's just a a type of policy where you're purchasing a contract for a limited number of years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. Those are the most common timeframes, but you're buying a contract for a short period of time because most people are thinking, oh, well, I'll build my assets during that time. I won't need life insurance anymore, or I need the insurance while my children are young. And so that's really what they're trying to do at the cheapest cost. On the opposite side of the spectrum are is something called the single premium policy. And that's where people are saying, okay, I just want to pay one time. And so on the term insurance side, people are saying, I want as much death benefit as I can possibly get for the lowest price. I want to pay the cheapest I possibly can. and I want the most death benefit I can possibly acquire. And on the opposite side of the spectrum, those people who are funding those policies are saying, you know, I want to shove this thing full of cash, as much cash as I can possibly put into this contract. And I want the death benefit as low as I can possibly get it because their focus is not the death benefit. Their focus is the cash value efficiency, the growth of their cash. And so in between these two extremes, you have right next to the term insurance, you have also the ordinary whole life policy. And so a whole life, it's like if an agent was coming to your house to help you with life insurance and they were trying to describe the two types and ask you what type would you like And they're saying, hey, you can get the term insurance. It'll be, say, $50 a month for the amount of coverage that you want. You can get it for 20 years. And then at the end of 20 years or maybe 30 years, the price will go up uh, and it will go up a lot. It will go up every year after that until one point it's just so high you just drop it. Or you might drop it at the end of the term, which most people do. Or you can get this other type of policy that's guaranteed to be there your entire life. It's guaranteed to pay a death benefit up until age 121. 
And so there's these two types. One only lasts a short time and it's very inexpensive. And the other, it's going to last till you're 121, but it's going to cost more. So let's just say the term insurance policy is $50 a month and the whole life policy is $200 a month for the same death benefit. So most people are choosing based on cost. They're saying, well, you know, this one's cheaper, this one's more expensive, or, you know, this whole life insurance does come with a savings feature. Maybe I want to save into this contract. So maybe I like it for that. But one other thing to note is that between the ordinary life policy and the single premium on the far left, the extreme, there is basically an infinite number of ways you can build these contracts. So that's why it's important to have someone who knows what they're doing. But you can build these contracts a bunch of different ways and you can have them paid for a certain amount of years and you can change all sorts of things. So what a lot of people don't know is that into their whole life policy where they were told it's gonna cost $200 a month to have this contract, what they're not aware of is that you actually can fund an extra, say, three to $400 into that same contract. And so your $200 contract, you could put maybe $500 into that contract. And that extra money is going in and fueling the growth of your policy, but it's not having a bunch of fees drain out of it. So the fees on this excess cash are essentially zero, depending on the company. And depending on how much excess you're putting in, um, they are can be zero, basically zero fee. So if you're able to save into a vehicle and not be charged a fee, not be having some of that fee draining away on your cash, that's just more helpful for you. You just have more efficiency of your cash because as you know, any investment that you do, there is fees. There is some sort of fee associated with that investment, whether you're buying real estate and so you have closing costs or interest or all these other fees, or whether you are investing in the market. Even if you're doing it on your own, you don't have an advisor, there are still uh, mutual fund expenses and things like that. So there's always going to be a fee. So if you can put in that money over and above the cost of the life insurance, that money doesn't incur a fee again, depending on the company and depending on how much. And so a lot of people don't know that. That's what makes it a lot more efficient. And that extra cash is called the paid up additions. So the first part of the premium, when I said that the cost was $200 a month, that is called the base premium. And so that's the base, the portion that's sustaining the death benefit and keeping it classified as a life insurance policy. And that paid up additions that's going in over and above that base premium is what's fueling it and causing it to be more cash efficient. And so lots of people, lots of affluent people, lots of rich people, you could say, were buying a lot of the far left, the single premium policy. They were putting a lot of money in there because the growth on that money was income tax free and they could access that money income tax free. And so they were just funding it really high. So the IRS, that's when they swooped in and said, I don't think so, you guys, what are you doing? I don't think that you can be doing that. That's not life insurance anymore. That's just a really cool investment. So if you fund it too high, then they no longer see it as a life insurance vehicle. They see it as an investment and all investments are taxable. And so that's when the IRS said, okay, if you put too much money into one of these types of contracts, it is going to become what we call a modified endowment contract. It will become taxable. And so when we're building these contracts, we're building them as close to this MEC line as we can without crossing it so that we're keeping the policy income tax free. And that changes. That's per person. That's per health rating. That depends on how much you want to fund the policy. And so it's not a perfect thing. It's not the same for everybody. That's why it has to be, it's helpful to have somebody who really knows what they're doing and to build a contract that's custom for you. Because even when you're starting with a premium, you may be starting with something, but three or four years down the road, you can already foresee that your premium will need to change or lower or that you'll have um, extra funds. And so it's helpful to have that information beforehand so that we can build that contract according to your current needs and according to what you're going to be able to sustain into the future and what your plans are going forward. Now, just to take a step back again, the term insurance is the way that you acquire life insurance at the least expensive cost. And the whole life is how you can 
get some coverage that will definitely be there. It's definitely going to pay a death benefit and it's going to grow cash that you can access all of your life. And so I do think, you know, I think there's a place for term. Um, I do help my clients a lot with term insurance as well. I own a lot of term insurance myself. And the reason is because when I bought my first whole life policy, I couldn't afford to purchase as much death benefit as I wanted with the whole life. Because remember that in order to keep it cash efficient, we are shrinking down that death benefit. And that's what's bringing us closer to the MEC line. And so... I couldn't afford to have as much death benefit as I wanted to protect my family. If something actually happens to me, I want my family to be well protected. I want my kids to be able to go to college or help with their first car. I want my husband to be able to pay off the bills and everything, pay off the house and help also with your his retirement maybe because certainly life insurance comes into play as you get older. If one spouse goes before the other, that can help in that surviving spouse's retirement. But because I didn't have as high of a death benefit as I wanted, I supplemented with term insurance. It was the least expensive. And then as I go forward, I can use that term insurance to my benefit. I will certainly go into that more in next week's episode. But ultimately, when building whole life contracts, the way to maximize the cash growth and efficiency of your policy is, again, to shrink that death benefit. And this works out differently for different people, different health ratings, different budgets. But this is just the overall gist. By doing this, by shrinking the death benefit, you have access to, in most cases, the majority of the funds you just paid into the contract in the beginning years of your contract and the policy gains steam each year that goes by. Once you own the contract, there is some flexibility to your payments. The flexibility does depend on the company and and different companies have different flexibility features. Some companies have products and that they're not flexible at all. And so it just depends. A lot of contracts will allow you to add more premium in a future year than what you started with in year one. Now, this can be dangerous because you are risking a mech if you're adding more money in a future year than what you started with in year one. Whether it's technically allowable or not, that doesn't mean the extra funds won't cause your policy to become taxable in some future year. So this is something your advisors should be coaching you through. Because essentially, when you start a contract, whatever you start with in year one is your ceiling because we're already starting as efficient as possible, as close to that mech ceiling as we can get, which means we're putting in as much money as we can without causing the policy to be seen as an investment vehicle and become taxable. And so when we started off that way, we're already at the ceiling. We can't put more money in or that can cause it to go over. And you, you may be able to put a little bit more money in, but you're just it, it's just getting more dangerous if you are trying to add those funds. So you've really got to be careful. And so what happens if my contract does become a mech? You might be asking yourself. Well, that would make all of your earnings inside the contract taxable as ordinary income. The contract would become tax deferred, just like it is with any retirement type of savings vehicle. But when accessing the cash, even if you're accessing it as a loan, the gains would be taxable. In addition, the gains are taxed first when you pull money from the contract. And just like any other retirement vehicle, you would incur a 10% penalty if you're pulling funds out before 59 and a half. Now that's on the gains only, so you'd only have to pay that penalty on the gains. But since the gains are taxed first, you would likely incur this penalty. Of course, I've got to say I'm not a CPA, so when you have tax questions, you should always confirm with your tax advisor. But since all other retirement savings vehicles are taxable and receive the early withdrawal penalty, it's not the end of the world if you end up making your contract. It's just way better to keep it or to keep the growth tax free especially with the way our country is spending money and the way they're likely to need more of our tax money. And so they're likely to increase our taxes. It's just better to keep the vehicle tax free. So if you have questions about this or would like to learn more about how a whole life contract could work for you or someone in your family, please reach out. You can reach me at Valerie at Alpha Omega Wealth dot com. I will be back at you again soon. Have a great week.
This is the podcastfactory.com.